Ushers, if there's anybody on the outside waiting to get in, you can let them in at this particular moment in time. I would that you would open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. I want to read verses 1 through 4. If you have legs and you have the strength to stand, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you don't have the strength to stand, it's more than okay, but we want to stand in reverence to the reading of the word of our God. Not long ago, I went to Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio, and people were standing in line for three hours just to get on one ride. It's only when we come to church, we don't want to stand. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, beginning with verse number 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Let the church shout willingly, not for filthy lucre, that means don't be greedy for money, but of a ready mind. Verse number three says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I also want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11. I want to read from the New Living Translation. Today's message is a continuation from Sunday. I don't want to go into this Sunday with just going through the motions. Uh, in our church, we celebrate four different days. We celebrate uh, Man Arise, which is traditionally Men's Day, where we celebrate biblical manhood and men lead worship. Uh, we celebrate Woman Arise, which is Women's Day, uh, where we celebrate biblical womanhood and women lead worship. We celebrate the church anniversary, which is the birthday of the church. We just did that, and uh, we have a pastoral anniversary celebration, and so many people ask why. Uh, why is that our tradition? Why is it our custom? Uh, to do this every year and I wanted to to give some practical and pragmatic principles as to why uh, the church has been doing this for years. First Corinthians 9 verse 11 New Living Translation says since we have planted spiritual seed among you aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink. I want to teach for a little while using this subject the purpose of of the pastor part two the purpose of the pastor part number two you may be seated in the presence of the lord if you miss part number one uh in your spare moments in your spare time i want you to log on to www.beatmetothestar.org click watch more sermons and the message from sunday will be available for your viewing and your listening pleasures the purpose of the pastor part two shameless plug this is bible study everybody say bible study Take out your cell phones right now. Text NRS Church to 22333. I want to teach for about 25 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of question and answer. The purpose of the pastor part number two. This past Sunday, we did the purpose of the pastor part number one because we wanted to explain to everyone in here under the sound of my voice this past Sunday that the pastor has a responsibility to the parishioners and the parishioners have a responsibility to the pastor due to the fact that it is, in fact, a two-way relationship. We talked about the idea that there's an extreme difference between honor and between worship. Whenever you honor somebody, you appreciate that individual. However, whenever you worship somebody, it's beyond appreciation to adoration. We concluded with the idea that pastors are meant to be honored, only Jesus is meant to be worshipped. But what has happened in 2019, we've elevated the pastor to the place of Jesus, we've demoted Jesus down to the place of the pastor. As a consequence, instead of us honoring the pastor and worshiping Jesus, so many churches have started to worship the pastor and we just honor Jesus. But I want you to understand pastors are meant to be honored. Only Jesus is meant to be worshiped. We talked about the idea that the pastor has a responsibility to the church. What is the pastor's responsibility to the church? According to Jeremiah chapter 
Peter number three, verse 15. Number one, the pastor is responsible for feeding the church with knowledge. Number two, the pastor is responsible for feeding the church with understanding. The Bible declares in Jeremiah chapter number three, verse 15, God speaks through Jeremiah and says, I will give you pastors. Let the church shout pastors. According to my own heart, you know that your pastor is given by God when your pastor has the heart of God. How do you know they have the heart of God when they prioritize God's agenda over their own agenda? Jeremiah says that I'm going to give you pastors according to my own heart and they will feed you with knowledge. Why do I need knowledge? Hosea chapter number six, verse four, write it down. Uh, the Bible declares that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So it is the biblical knowledge that comes from the mouth of your pastor that keeps you from being destroyed by Satan and that causes you to have victory inside of your life. So the purpose of your pastor, number one, is to feed you with knowledge. The purpose of your pastor, number two, is to feed you with understanding. Let the church shout understanding. I used to be of the mindset, it does not matter where you go to church, as long as you go to church. I've changed that mindset. It matters where you go to church. Because if you were in a place where you do not understand, when Jesus gives to all of us the parable of the sower and the seed, he talks about how it is that Satan immediately steals the word of God from the hearts of the people who do not understand. And you can never produce if the word does not take root and according to Jesus's parable of the sower and the seed the word can never take root if you do not understand as a consequence it matters where you go to church you need to be in a place where you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth did you hear what I just said so the purpose of your pastor is to feed you with knowledge it is a knowledge that keeps you from being destroyed the purpose of your pastor is to feed you with understanding and then we talked about this idea in Ephesians chapter number four where the Bible declares that he gave some to be apostles some to be prophets some to be evangelists some to be pastors and teachers why did he do this for the perfecting of the saints that word perfecting literally means the equipping of the saints it is the pastor's responsibility to equip the people of God to do ministry for the purpose of building up the body but after we talked about the reality that your pastor has a responsibility to you, we then talked about the reality that you have a responsibility back to your pastor. What is my responsibility back to my pastor? Number one, pray for my pastor fervently. Somebody shout, pray for the pastor. Paul the apostle, when speaking to his young protege in the faith by the name of Timothy, According to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, Paul talks about how it is that we are to pray for all men, especially kings and those who are in authority, that we might live a quiet and a peaceable life. But after we pray for our pastor fervently, number two, pay your pastor generously. Pay your pastor generously. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 around verse number 17, Paul says, let the elders, that word word elder is interchangeable with bishop and pastor in the New Testament that the elders that rule well ought to be counted worthy of double honor that word honor is not just a term of respect but that word honor is a term of numeration which is where we get the English word honorarium if you don't believe me look in the New Living Translation which is the thought for thought translation that says the elders that rule well ought to be respected and and it literally says they ought to be paid well. So we talked about pay, uh, praying for your pastor fervently. We talked about paying your pastor generously, whoever your pastor is. Then we talked about performing what your pastor says biblically. Perform what your pastor says biblically. Why is that? Because in Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 17, write it down. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 17, the Bible declares that one day your pastor is going to have to stand before God and give an account on your behalf. 
That means that every soul that comes across the star, one day I literally have to stand before God and give an account for every soul that was under my jurisdiction. So it says, obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves to them. Sub meaning under. Mit meaning mission. To come under the mission of Christ that they may give an account for your souls and that they may do it with joy. So watch this. Your pastor has a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility back to your pastor. Today's message is the purpose of the pastor, part number two. Everybody shout part number two. I want to continue with this idea of your pastor's responsibility to you and your responsibility back to your pastor. Here's the first thing that I want you to understand. Number one, your pastor is not perfect. Somebody shout, my pastor is flawed. Somebody say it again, my pastor is flawed. Somebody say it one more time, my pastor is flawed. So when you see the flaws of your pastor, it is no excuse for you to run to another church. Now, if they are flawed and they are proud to be flawed and they are using their flaws as an excuse to lord over the people like this is the example, you need to run somewhere else. But if they are flawed and they understand that God is working on them. In other words, I'm not where I need to be, but I thank God that I'm not where I used to be, but I'm in the process of sanctification, just like the people of God, which is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's somebody that you want to be under. So the first thing I want you to understand today is that my pastor is flawed. We know this to be true because the scripture that we read here, this clearly was from 1 Peter. That means that Peter, the apostle of Jesus, is is the writer of this text. And notice what Peter wrote. He wrote, the elders which are among you, I exhort. This is 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse 1. He says, I encourage. I already told you that word elder in the New Testament is used interchangeably with bishop and pastor all at the same time. So he says, the elders, the pastors which are among you, I encourage, who am also an elder. Peter says, I'm encouraging the pastors among you, but I'm also a pastor myself. I'm encouraging the bishops among you, but I'm also a bishop myself. Wait a minute. How did flawed Peter become a bishop? Because you do understand that Peter is not qualified to be a bishop in 1 Peter chapter number 5 because he's cussing people out in Matthew 26. He's not qualified to be a bishop in 1 Peter chapter number 5 because he has coward tendencies in Matthew 26. He said to Jesus that when they come to take you, that anybody that tries to get to you has to go through me. And when they came to take Jesus, he denied him three times before the cock crowed two times because he had flaws inside of his life. He's not qualified to be a bishop in 1 Peter chapter number 5 because he has anger management issues in John chapter number 18 verse 10. It's this same Peter who cut the ear off to the servant of the high priest when this servant named Malchus came to take Jesus to the cross. So on one hand I see his flaws but on the other hand I see his faith. I dare you to touch the person beside you and tell him I'm flawed but I still got faith. Is that anybody's testimony getting here at 12 noon? I got flaws on one hand, but please do not get it twisted. In spite of all of my flaws, somebody shout, I still have faith. And it is flawed Peter who makes this statement. First Peter chapter number five, he writes, the elders, the pastors which are among you, he says, I exhort. That word exhort means to encourage, who am also an elder, who am also a pastor and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here's the first thing I want you to understand. Somebody shout, my pastor is flawed. Shameless plug, take out your cell phones, text NRS Church to 22333. I want you to text in your questions. Number two, my pastor is responsible for feeding me with God's word. My pastor is responsible for feeding me with God's word. Why do I say this? I'm talking about this because I can't give you 1 Timothy 5 and 17 without giving you this. Because 1 Timothy 5 and 17 says, let the elders, the pastors that rule well, be counted worthy 
worthy of double honor. 1 Timothy 5, 17, and the New Living Translation says, the pastors and elders that rule well ought to be respected and paid well. Only those that rule well. So how do you know if your pastor is ruling well? Your pastor is ruling well if they are fulfilling these biblical responsibilities in the first place. So not all pastors are worthy of double honor. It's only the pastors that are ruling well. Those that feed you with knowledge. Those that feed you with understanding. Those that equip you to do ministry in order to build up the body of Christ. Those that feed you with the word of God. Somebody shout the word of God. There are so many people who take a text, yet when they preach and they teach, they are far from the text. And scripture without a context is not scripture at all. I don't just want you to tell me what the text is. I need somebody who can rightly divide the word of truth. Why do you think that Paul the Apostle said to his young protege in the faith by the name of Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15, he said, study. Let the church shout, study. He said, Timothy, if you're going to be a pastor, you have to devote your life to the study of God's word. Because how can you expect the people to study if you don't study yourself? So he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, not to show yourself approved unto people. It doesn't matter what people think about you. It matters what God thinks about you. He says, a workman that need him not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does it mean to rightly divide the word of truth? It means to feed the people with the word of God. Somebody shout, in context. When you put it in context, you get to the original intent of the author and you bring modern day application to the audience that you were talking to at this particular moment in time. So notice what he says in 1 Peter chapter number 5 verse 2. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed the flock of God. Feed the people of God. You are the flock. The responsibility of the pastor is to feed the flock of God, which is among you. Not feed everybody else and forsake the flock that you have at home. Because I'm convinced, and I ain't talking about nobody, but sometimes so many pastors are going out in the name of preaching revival, and they ain't preaching revival, they preaching survivals. So we go out on the road, and in some cases, we're making all of this money on the road, and we're neglecting at home. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? But Peter says, feed the flock of God, which is among you. I want you to know that those of you who attend the star, you get my best. My best might not be somebody else's best, but I'm not going to go all over the world and give them my best and neglect the people of God who are faithful to show up every Sunday and every Wednesday. You get my best and everybody else gets my leftovers. So whatever this is today, I want you to know this is the best that I got today. If it's not good enough, it's just not good enough, but it's the best that I can do right now. Somebody shout, it's his best. My pastor is responsible for feeding me the word of God. Watch this. Peter says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Number three, my pastor is responsible for watching over my soul. It is my responsibility to feed. It is also my responsibility to watch. Did you hear what I just said? It is my responsibility to feed. It is my responsibility to watch over the souls of the people that God entrusts among me and entrusts to me. What is my soul? My soul is my mind. Everybody shout my mind, my will, my emotions. My mind represents my thoughts. I'm watching over your thoughts. My mind represents my will. My will is indicative of my desires. I'm watching over your desires. And, 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 and watch this, watch this. My mind represents my thoughts. My will represents my desires. And then my emotions represents my feelings. Everybody shout my feelings. 
So watch this. It's the pastor's responsibility to watch over my soul. First Peter 5, verse 2, and the B clause of the verse, it says, feed the flock of God which is among you. That's feed. Taking the oversight thereof. Another translation says, taking care of God's people. Another translation says, watching over the souls of God's people. So it is the pastor's responsibility to feed the flock that is among him. It is also the pastor's responsibility to oversee the souls of God's people. Number three, my pastor is responsible not just for watching over my soul, but he's responsible, and as he watches over my soul, he must have a willing spirit devoid of greed. Everybody shout, a willing spirit devoid of greed. You don't want to sit under anybody and they don't feel like doing what it is that God has called them to do. I mean, if it takes that much for you to do what God has called you to do, then maybe I need to go somewhere else. Anybody ever call themselves doing you a favor, but they really didn't want to do it in the first place, so you didn't want what they had to offer in the first place? That's exactly what God is saying concerning your pastor. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, so feed and watch over their souls, not by constraint. Nobody should have to make your pastor do what it is that God has called your pastor to do. But if God has called your pastor, it's not about what your pastor is driving, it's about who's driving your pastor. If the spirit is in your pastor, driving your pastor, your pastor, whoever that is, couldn't sit down if they wanted to sit down. There is nothing else I'm convinced that I could be doing and be in the will of God. Some people can leave ministry and they can go do other things. Later for that, I can't do that. I wish I could, but I can't. Well, matter of fact, I don't wish that I could because when I started preaching, I didn't want to preach. But now that I'm preaching and now that I'm pastoring God's people, I realize that this is literally what God has placed me on earth to do. As a consequence, this ain't a job to me. It's not a job to me. I get energized by being around you. I don't get drained from being around you. So watch this. I got to have the right attitude. Your pastor, whoever that is, must have the right attitude, not by constraint, but willingly. Everybody shout willingly. It also says the void of greed. It says not for filthy lucre. That means your pastor should not be greedy, but of a ready mind. Somebody shout of a ready mind. Okay, here's the last thing. My pastor must be an example. My pastor must be an example. Now, wait a minute. The first thing you said is that my pastor is flawed. So how are you going to come back and say my flawed pastor must be an example? I'm glad you asked that question. I got a good class. Text NRS Church to 22333. I'm going to answer this question even before you text it in. Watch this. Your pastor is an example, not of perfection. Your pastor is an example of how to please God even when life is not perfect and even in the midst of their own imperfections. So if you watch your pastor long enough, you may see some things in his life that are temporarily out of order. You may see some things in his life that you say, mm, that don't line up necessarily. Because guess what? Your pastor is going through the same thing that you go through. None of us are exempt. The only difference is you get to go through yours in private and your pastor has to go through his in public. So you may see some stuff, but watch this. The example is not an example of perfection. The example is when life is not perfect, how do they handle it? Because based upon how my pastor handles it, if they're handling it in a way that pleases God, that's the way I want to handle it. Your pastor can experience sickness the same way that you can experience a sickness. Your pastor can experience a financial deficit the same way that you can experience a financial deficit. Your pastor can experience Satan wreaking havoc in his family the same way that you can experience Satan wreaking havoc inside of your family. It's not a perfect example, but the question is, how do they handle it? 
Do they handle it in a way that pleases God, that causes them to overcome, that causes them to triumph? Because if I see them go through it and I see how they handle it and it caused them to have victory and please God, then guess what? When I go through it, I want to be able to walk through it the same way. So I got to be an example. First Peter 5 verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples, being an example to the flock. Now, that is the pastor's responsibility to the people. But I want you to understand that the people have a responsibility to the pastor. Tell the person beside you, my pastor has a purpose. I want you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church at Corinth. And in essence, Paul is giving up his own right. Paul understands that ministry is not something that's going to make you rich. As a consequence, he's a talented tent maker from Tarsus on the side. Paul is a businessman. He has his own business on one hand, but in spite of him having his own business on one hand, he's in the ministry on the other hand. And he's dealing with a group of people who think that because he's in ministry, he should not get anything financially. And because he's dealing with a group of people who have the mindset that because you're in ministry, you should not reap anything financially, Paul has to debunk that mindset. He says, wait a minute, please don't get it twisted. First of all, what I have didn't necessarily come from ministry, but if it did come from ministry, there would be no problem with it coming from ministry because notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse 11. Matter of fact, I want you to read the whole 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 because in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11, New Living Translation, he says, since we have planted spiritual seed among you, Aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? In other words, the pastor sows spiritual things to you. You sow material things back into the life of your pastor. Did you hear what I just said? So the pastor does not prosper before the people. The pastor prospers as the people prosper. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? So he says, since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? There's another scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 when Paul lays down the law. He says, isn't it written, watch this, that you should not muzzle the mouth of the ox? In other words, the same ox that treads and tills the soil and tills the stony ground and works all day ought to be able to eat from the produce of that soil. Don't muzzle the mouth of the ox. The same pastor that labors among you ought to be able to share in the material blessings from the labor that he does among the people. Because guess what? Not only does your pastor have a responsibility to you, you have have a responsibility back to your pastor. And the question has to be raised, what happens when we do not fulfill that responsibility? We have bivocational pastors and we have full-time pastors all at the same time. And the Bible declares that beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel to be bivocational says that you are in ministry, but you have a secular job on the side, and there are some pastors that is their plight, and they're working really, really hard, and I admire and I honor bivocational pastors. Uh, I don't even see how they do it to put all this time, 40 hours a week in a secular job, and then to have another full-time job watching over the souls of people. Those people are to be commended because that's not easy. But watch this. You also have full-time pastors. So you got bivocational pastors, but you also have full-time pastors. Their full-time responsibility is to watch over the souls of the people. Now, whenever you sit down at the dinner table to eat, you don't want to eat somebody's cooking when the food is not good. And the food can't be good if they don't take time to prepare the food. So watch this. The drawback of being bivocational is that you don't have as much time to prepare. 
But at the same time, the reason I'm bivocational is because the church that I'm serving is not necessarily able to be to a point right now where they are able to take care of the material needs of the pastor. So every church should aspire to grow to the point to where you can support a pastor full time so that when they feed you, the food is not half cooked. Now, I'm not saying bivocational pastors have cooked their food. They do the best that they can, just like full-time pastors do the best that they can. Because on the other hand, you got some full-time pastors, and their food ain't good either. <laughs> Somebody shout balance. Here's what I'm trying to convey. Here's what I'm trying to convey. As children of God, your pastor has a responsibility to you. But you also have a responsibility to your pastor. And if your pastor is feeding you spiritual things, we are responsible for sowing material things back into the life of your pastor. Let the church shout amen. amen. Tell the person beside you, my pastor has a purpose. All right, take out your cell phones, text NRS Church to 22333. I want to answer as many questions as I can. As many questions as I can. If we have any questions, put them up. We got our first question. Uh, let's read it together with uplifted voices. One, two, ready, read. Is it our job to feed God's people along with the pastor? Are you talking about physical food? Is it our job? I assume that that is somebody in the congregation. It is a parishioner. So is it our job to feed God's people along with the pastor? Yes. In the Old Testament, they had a system of tithing. Everybody say tithing. The question has to be raised, what happened to the tithe once it was given? I want you to research it in the Old Testament. The tithe went to two groups of people. Those two groups of people start with a P. Number one, it went to the priest. Number two, it went to the poor. Did you hear what I just said? Number one, it went to the priest. A portion of the tithe went to the priest, the old-time equivalent to the modern-day pastor. Number two, it went to the poor. It was God's system for making sure that the Levitical priesthood was taken care of because the Levitical priesthood of the tribe of Levi, every other tribe of Israel, when they walked into the promised land, got an inheritance except for the Levitical tribe. They didn't get an inheritance, so God says, since you're not going to get an inheritance, you're not going to get land like everybody else, I'm going to make sure that everybody else that I grant this land to, everybody else that I grant this wealth to, they're going to bring 10% of all of the produce off the land. They're going to bring it to the temple. You won't have the land, but you'll be taken care of from the 10%. That's in the Old Testament. Not only does the priest get taken care of from the 10%, he says, make sure you leave some for the poor because God has a heart for the poor. So that's a long answer to this question, but the answer is yes. It is our responsibility to feed God's people physically and to feed your pastor physically as well. And the way that we do it is through the tithe and the offerings of the people. Let's put up another question. All right, number two, let's read it together. One, two, ready, read. If we need our pastor to help guide us, who does the pastor lead on? I'm glad you asked. Uh, you learned it in Sunday School 101, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, what's interesting is that David, who is a shepherd, is the writer of this text. And David, who is a shepherd, says, the Lord is my shepherd. Every shepherd needs a shepherd. Did you hear what I just said? Every shepherd needs a shepherd. Now, I realize not every shepherd has a shepherd, but every shepherd needs a shepherd themselves. So who does the pastor lean on? I can't speak for everybody, but I do have three shepherds inside of my life, three accountability partners. One is a father figure. The other two are like brothers to me and I lean on them. I run things by them concerning my personal life. I run things by them concerning this church. 
God, because I don't want to be out here alone all by myself. No man is an island. Christianity is not meant to be walked alone. You need somebody else who can help push you in the right direction. Okay, let's take another one. Let's read it together. Dr. Beavers, I heard you say that at one point you believe one should be loyal to their church. Will you elaborate on what changed your mind? Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, you grow up in a church and you love it. Your family goes to the church and you love the church. But so many people, not everybody, so many people are in this dilemma where I've grown up in the church and my family's been here my whole life, but I'm really just here because they're here and I really don't understand. If you understand and God has set you there, then stay there. But if you are at a place where you don't understand there, you're going to have to make a decision. Either you can decide to stay there and continue to lack in your spiritual growth because you don't understand, or you can decide to leave and get what it is that God desires for you to have at the expense and the probability of disappointing those you love. Why do I need to be in a place where I understand? Because when Jesus gives the parable of the sower and the uh, seed, a sower who is the preacher went out to sow the seed, which is the word. The word fell on four different kinds of grounds. There was only one good ground that produced fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. All right, so every time a preacher is preaching the word, it's falling on four different kinds of hearts. Only one kind of heart is productive, okay? I want to see the fruit of God produced in my life. And when Jesus explained this parable, he says, if it's falling on a heart that does not understand the word, he says immediately Satan comes in to steal it because of their lack of understanding. And it can never take root to produce if Satan is stealing it from you. But the only way he can steal it is if you don't understand. So guess what? It matters for your spiritual growth, what church you are a part of. If you don't understand here, you don't need to be here. That goes for this church too. If you don't understand somewhere else where your spiritual growth, you don't need to be in a place what you do not understand. Okay, let's take one or two more. Let's read it together. One, two, ready, read. What does feed the flock, not for filthy lucre, but willingly mean? Uh, basically, it means don't be greedy. It means don't be a hireling. It means don't be in this for money. That's what it means. Yes, the people have a responsibility to support the material needs of the pastor. Yes, the Bible says that if, if the elders are ruling well, they ought to be paid well. 1 Timothy 5, 17, New Living Translation. But there's a balance to that thing. Basically, he says, if you're going to care about my people, you can't be in this for what you can get out of it. God is just using your pastor but he cares about the people. And if the pastor does not care about God's people and the pastor is only in it for themselves, God is saying you in it for the wrong reason. So that's exactly what that means. Let's take, okay, that's it, that's it. God bless you. Come on, put your hands together.